Hi, and welcome today for our lesson on roots and radicals. What does it mean to be a perfect square, a perfect cube, a square root, or a cube root? Well, these are terms you might have heard before when you're thinking about area and volume. But what does it mean when we think about just in our math class? Square root, cube root? Well, not exactly. When you think of a square root, we look at the idea that it is a two-dimensional figure, and that this side times this side would equal to the area of the inside. For a cube root, we're thinking just three-dimensionally. So now we have the length, the width, and the height, and so we multiply all three of them and represent the volume of the figure. A radical is an expression that has a square root, cube root, or any expression to the nth root. Radicals are used in algebra for determining distance between two points, in finance for predicting the future of value, or many physics and engineering applications. You see the notation here for a radical. This part here in the little check mark is called the index. Now, depending on the radical, sometimes there's not a number there. If there's no number given, it's implied that it's a 2. Underneath the check mark, there is called the radicand. And the radicand can actually have its own power as well. We'll talk about that. Perfect squares and square roots. Perfect square can be defined as a rational number multiplied by itself. Remember, a rational number is any number that can be expressed as a fraction a terminating decimal or repeating decimal and so on. A square root can be defined as a number which multiplied by itself gives you the original number. So perfect squares and square roots, well, they're just kind of inverse of each other. Here's an example. We have a times a equals to a squared. Therefore, the square root of a squared would be a. So this is just telling us what value times itself Right, so a times itself would be a squared. And as I said before, this part of the, the check mark here has no nothing, no number there, so that means it implies that it's a 2. Take a moment to pause and list the first uh, 1 through 15 and their perfect squares. What you would have come up with is these values. So starting with 1 squared, right? 1 squared is 1. Therefore, the square root of 1 equals to 1. The square root of 4 is 2 because 2 squared is 4 and so on. So we get to 225. So um, these you should just be familiar with. It's going to make things easier when we see values. And you can think of it also as a pair of factors that get to leave the house. So here's my little house, that's my radical here, and 25, when I break 25 into its factors of 5 and 5, this pair factors out to 5. So 5 squared would be equal to 25, kind of going full circle there. Perfect cubes and cube roots. Perfect cubing is defined as a rational number multiplied by itself three times, and a cube root is a number which has been multiplied by itself three times. So, again, they are essentially inverse of each other. The main difference is now that the index is three to imply the cube root. And now notice here that it's different in the notation. Here we have it in the index. So a times a times a is a cubed. Therefore, the cube root of a cubed is a. List the integers 1 through 10 and their perfect cube values. Take a moment to write these down. For example, 1 times 1 times 1, well, that's 1. 2 times 2 times 2, and keep going from there. We should have been able to come to at least to 1,000, though some numbers in between might have been more challenging. You might have needed to use a calculator for this. Again, going back to our example, think of this as a triple. So inside my house, I have 125. But 125 is really 5 times 5 times 5. So this group of 3 factors out to be 5. 5 cubed 
equals to 125 to bring that back full circle. Factor trees are just one technique that we use in order to simplify. A square root one comma strategy in using this tree is to kind of give you a good visual for the prime factors. When I say prime numbers, remember prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. So it's any number that, that is only divisible by 1 and itself. And it's good to break numbers down to prime numbers because when they're composite numbers, which means, for example, 4 is a composite number because it's 2 times 2, there might be values that could be simplified further. Here's a good example. If I factored out 90, I could go all these different paths, right? I could go 9 times 10, but 9 factors down to 3 times 3 and 10 to 2 times 5. Or I could go 3 times 30. Now, 3 times 30 might go, well, 3 times 3 times 10, that was 30, and then 10 is going to break down to a 5. So no matter which path you take when you do prime factorization, you'll always end up with all the same factors here. So the idea for us is to fully simplify these values. So let's start with some examples here and look at prime factorization. And you'll notice that I am not using perfect squares because those perfect squares are ones that we reviewed on the previous slide. If you break down the square root of 8, the square root of 8 would have broken down to 4 times 2. The square root of 4 is 2, so 2 gets to come out of the house, but there's one more 2 left, so it stays. So the final outcome would be read 2 root 2. If I look at this as the factor tree, I took 8 and I broke it down, and then I'm circling. So a good strategy might be to circle your prime numbers. Sometimes we put squares around our perfect squares to show that those numbers are actually going to be factoring out. So if I wanted to look at it expanded this way, this 2 times 2 was the 4 from 4. So this pair factors out. So there's a lot of strategies with simplifying. So what I'd like you to do is just uh, try one, then check, try it and check, and then we'll go from there. So 24 breaks down, 4 times 6. 6 breaks down to 2 times 3. and two times, So you'll notice here that there's not a lot, right? 4 is our perfect square. So the square root of 4 is 2, but 2 times 3 doesn't have that. So not all composite numbers can contain squares, so sometimes they have to stay in the radical. 45 factored down to 9 times 5. 9 is a perfect square. The square root of 9 is 3, so this becomes 3 root 5. So 32 is 36 times 2, square root of 36. So notice here the pattern, right? Anytime I can take a perfect square, I can factor that out. So it's easy to kind of break them down. So when you, when you get perfect squares, a good strategy might be to stop there instead of breaking it down with this factor tree. 75 is 25 times 3, square root of 25 is 3, so 5 root 3. And even with bigger numbers, what you want to do is identify perfect squares, and if you can't identify perfect squares, just start with the smallest prime as you break them down, whichever your strategy is. In this case, 4 times 9 times 5, 4 and 9 are both perfect squares. So the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of 9 is 3. So they both factored out to the left of the radical, and then we find their product to get 6 root 5. Lastly, the square root of 31 does not simplify because 31 is a prime number. So any prime numbers you have, unless there's a pair, will not factor. So a few more examples. When you're doing these, try to show the missing step that you would use to get there. For example, the square root of 289 is 17. So that tells us a little bit about that particular number. So another strategy is when you break it apart here, you might recognize that you have a pair, which is a pair that factors. So 289 was a perfect square, and so that pair of 17s factors out to 17 here. What about the next example? So 400, you might have been more familiar with that number. So a pair of 20s factors out. How about the square root of 71? 
the trick just is fully simplified. It's prime and cannot be factored. And this is where it starts to get even more challenging because now let's look at, at values rather than our variables rather than values. So if it's the same idea that 17 times 17 was uh, 289, then a times a is a squared. So write these values in expanded form and then look for pairs. One pair of a's factors a to the first power. One pair of b's factors b to the first power. Two pairs of c's factors c to the second power. Now we're breaking down both numbers and variables. You can identify the sets of pairs, and it fully simplifies. Try this last problem. Four was a perfect square, so I'm using a little strategy to put a square around this. Square root of four is equal to two. One pair of y's, one z, and then 11 and y, they don't have a pair. They're also not perfect square, so they stay within the radical. Math is radical. Well, sometimes. See you next lesson.